Here is the very last paragraph on page 239. But there, is no, but there is more to this case. When Andrew Hamilton spoke to that jury in 1735, he said words that are worth listening to right now. The question before the court, and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not of small nor private concern, said Hamilton. It is not the cause of one poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government. On the mainland of America, it is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. Page 240, Chapter 52, Frenchmen and the Indians. By the 18th century, Europe had finished with hundreds of years of religious war. It had not, however, finished with war. A new kind of conflict was beginning. This new kind of war was fought for economic gain. The fight was about land and money, not ideas or religion. For more than a century, Britain, France, and Spain would fight each other in a series of small wars on several continents. There was King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, and the French and Indian War. In the North, in North America, the French and Indian War changed the future of the continent. It was a war to answer this question, which would be stronger, be the stronger power in North America, England or France? France the French colonists and France's Indian allies fought against England, the English colonies, and England's Indian allies. The war began with conflicts about land. France and England had real arguments over the same pieces of land. French explorers Marquette, Juliet, La Salle, and others had been the first Europeans in the region around the Great Lakes and also in the lands drained by the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. France had sent traders and trappers to those territories and had set up trading posts as well. French traders were at Lake Huron in 1612, eight years before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth. England claimed the same land. In the original English charters, the king granted land from coast to coast, even though no one had any idea where the west coast was. Now that the land along the east coast was filling up, the English-speaking settlers had begun pushing west. Indian hunting grounds were disappearing as the whites moved in. The Indians were alarmed. They were willing to fight to preserve their land. The English had signed treaties and bought land from man many of the Indian nations, but sometimes the treaties were signed without the Indians understanding the details. Indians thought the earth belonged to everyone. One Indian said selling land was like selling the sea or the sky. And yet, though Indians never owned land individually, Indian tribes did claim the right to use an area of land. It was those rights they signed over to the English. When the English colonists signed treaties with the Indians, the, the people who signed the treaties usually meant to honor them. The trouble was that the people who actually signed the treaties weren't the ones who lived on the frontier near the Indians. Those frontier people were often rough and rowdy. They wanted land, and sometimes they didn't mind killing for it. On the very last paragraph on 241. If the Indians had united, perhaps they might have been able to resist the frontier people, but old feuds kept the Indian tribes apart. So when England and France started fighting each other, some Indians sided with the English. Others helped the French. They kept picking at each other, the English, the French, and the Indians, raiding and scalping and killing. Soon the hatred was intense. New France, Canada, was different from English America, and that made for conflict too. There was no religious freedom there. The French insisted that all settlers in their territories be Catholic and French. So when 200,000 Huguenots, who were Protestants, fled from France, many settled in the British colonies. If France had let them settle in Canada, that country would have been stronger. It is easy for us to see that now, but it wasn't so easy then. France was more interested in the fur trade and the money it brought than in settling people on the land. So, when English traders began buying furs from the Native Americans and paying high prices for those furs, it made France angry. It hurt their fur business. The French 
were the best friends of the Indians. The French were the best friends the Indians had in North America. Mostly they were trappers, traders, and fishermen, like the Native Americans. They understood and respected the land in the way the English never learned. But the Iroquois didn't care. They didn't like them. The Iroquois had been enemies of the French ever since Samuel de Champlain sided against them in their battle with a Huron tribe back in 1609. This was too bad for the French, for the Iroquois led a strong league of six Indian nations. They were the most powerful Indians in Eastern America. Top of page 243. Remember, France and England were both claiming the same territory, especially the lands watered by the Ohio River and its tributaries. The French built forts in that area. One fort was built where Pittsburgh stands today, so over in Pennsylvania. The French called it Fort Duquesne. Duquesne. Oh, Duquesne. <laughs> the English said that the fort was in Virginia, and the land belonged to them. The governor of Virginia sent a 21-year-old surveyor to tell the French to move on and out. A surveyor is a person who measures and maps land. This surveyor's name was George Washington. The French told George Washington they were at Fort Duquesne to stay. Washington and 150 men tried to make them go. They attacked a French scouting party and killed 10 Frenchmen. An English writer, Horace Walpole, said of that small battle, the volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America set the world on fire. It was 1754. The French and Indian War had begun. Uh, top of page 244. Washington built a small fort called Fort Necessity. He built it on low ground. When the French attacked, Washington and his men were outnumbered, but they held out until it started raining. Heavy rain flooded the fort, soaked all their gunpowder, and left them defenseless. The French captured the fort, but Washington escaped and learned a lesson he would remember when he became a great general. Don't build a camp on low ground. Second paragraph on 244. He learned even more important lessons when he fought with England's famous Major General Edward Broad Raddock. Braddock, Braddock arrived in America in 1755. He was expected to push the French out of the Ohio Territory. Braddock decided to begin by capturing Fort Duquesne, and he thought he knew just how to do that. The general had been trained in Europe on o great open battlefields where armies lined up facing each other and shot long, clumsy guns called muskets. Braddock assumed that European methods would work in America. George Washington wrote of the British troops in their bright red coats and the Virginia troops in their handsome blue coats, all marching through the green forest. He said it was one of the most beautiful sights he had ever seen, but he realized those colorful coats were great targets. Braddock didn't. The French and their Indian allies wouldn't fight the kind of war Braddock wanted to fight. They wouldn't stand in a straight line and let the English shoot at them. They hid in the woods. They wore skins to camouflage themselves. The Indians screamed blood-chilling war whoops. They shot at the British troops from the woods. The British panicked. They broke and ran as sheep pursued by dogs, wrote Washington. The French and Indians were outnumbered almost two to one, but they destroyed the English forces. General Braddock was killed. George Washington escaped with four bullet holes in his coat. Two horses were shot under him, but he learned lessons from Braddock's mistakes.